good lord, you're worse than Tommy about knowing what your job is on this I show. Don't know. <laughs> Did we just do everything? No, we got to do the intro. You got to do that I cold, cold, cold that, that very Hold short, on. cold intro oh. tease. Hold on. Get kind crazy. Breathy, Get crazy. Remember. Breathy and kind of sultry, please. I'm expanding the chest. <laughs> Ooh. Takes a lot. Got a lot of breath in there. <laughs> All right, hold on. I got to tell my family to shut up. <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm back. Okay, okay. you ready? Yep. Go, Mom. Breathy. Oh. So this week on Three Sides of the Coin, not only are you joined by me, but we are also joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Eddie Goalie. Trump. <laughs> the joke that never dies. It's it's like it's a lot. It's did you men- did you did you mention Eddie Trunk? I did. I said the myth, the man, the legend, okay. Eddie Trunk. Just I want to make it. sure you said it loud enough. I said it pretty loud. I got breathy too. I was expanding my my lungs. Mm. Said it. Look, Steeler stuff. Still wearing. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Right into the ground. Sorry. <laughs> so tune in. We talk a lot of kiss, and I mean a lot of kiss. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. You got four coins today. The the original remastered co-hosts are here. You got Michael, Tommy, <laughs> Mark, and the beautiful Lisa. I thought I would grace everyone with my presence today. Mm-hmm. It, it is. We're always checking. It's we always check in with Lisa. Are you joining us this week? I know. And you sometimes know we don't hear from her, and other times, yes. Well, it, it's, I have it's kids' school stuff, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah, just tell the kids to keep it quiet and tell the husband to feed them. You can always tell the uh, the Kleenex stock shoots up when Lisa's on, <laughs> among other things. <laughs> oh my, okay. All right, so r- real quick, hey, Sumter, do you got any comments to read? Yes, I do. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> Two <laughs> weeks in a row, Mark, he's done his job. Oh. Because because I'm actually Give on these raise. shows. Because I'm actually on these shows. Yeah, maybe I can actually get a dollar. Um, so mm. our current that the current um, show that just dropped was with uh, Johnny O'Neill from Dare Force. For those of you that don't know, check it out. He his band opened for Kiss on the Creatures Tour. Um, Magnificent Butcher seventy seven said this stirs memory. Af- uh, this stirs a memory after my mom died. My stepdad briefly dated this girl in the eighties, whose brother was in Dare Force. They offered to bring me down to the cities to see them, but I never did. Oh, local nostalgia! And then I got a lot of we got a lot of like just great. Uh, interview and really enjoyed the show so thank you guys for the support yeah a lot there there is a lot of love that's coming i mean it literally only went up today that we're recording this but lots of love for it i mean i got an email from somebody who was like oh my god when i heard you mention obsession i nearly screamed because you know he remembers them right it's it's that local feel now again it you know if you weren't in in minneapolis you might go who cares trust me give it a listen this has a very cool kiss story at the beginning there's but then there's a, just a lot of rock and roll talk about you know a big regional band and as we said in the show every city around the world has got that big regional band where everybody goes how come it never happened what went wrong you know they were the band that was always opening doing two or three nights i mean this was such a great insight with with johnny right I agree. Um, all right. So there's nothing else. Oh, Tom, uh, Mark, you need to do a yes. shout out. Bill Dungeon. Thank you. This is fucking totally sweet for you. Non drummers. This is a piccolo snare. It's thinner and smaller than a normal snare. Uh, Bill is, is not only on our kiss three sides pace. He's on a, on a Ludwig drum 
page that I'm on. And we just started chatting and I was, he does drums, he, you know, builds drums and stuff. And he's like, Hey, I'm going to send you one of these. And, and I'm like, you know what? These are made for subtle more playing. You know, I, I play in a heavy hard rock band and, you know, I'm like, I've always wanted to just screw around with that kind of drum, but it, it's not practical. And he's like, it would be my honor to send you one. And, and he just said just some of the nicest things about our show, uh, you know, and uh, you know what I mean? I just want to say thank you um, from the bottom of my heart that, you know, to, to get a gift of a, of a drum, you know, to a drummer, that's, that's pretty freaking huge, man. So thank right. you. Um, you know, I tell you what, you know, much like, you know, last week, uh, you know, Cindy shout out and all the, I'm sure you guys saw this week. I, I posted some stuff when I was, you know, sorting out some kiss clips and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of you, you know, responded to the, to the stuff I posted on our fan site. And thanks, man. That just, again, I, I try to show some stuff that, you know, you probably would never see, um, better than I guess seeing Mego dolls and kiss board games and stuff. So, you know, I don't do it a lot, but, uh, you know, when I get the, in the mood to do it, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad to see so many appreciative people and so many people just as interested in this geeky stuff as I am. So, which is really a great lead into our guest this week. <laughs> well, I, I was, I was just going to say, you know, all this stuff Mark posts is just like magic. <laughs> Oh, the gift that keeps on giving. So, I, and, and I will just say this, because we won't get into it, because we might get into it in a later episode. Probably so, next week at some point. <laughs> somebody, so, yeah, that's true. Somebody this week made a comment that that book, Magic, is about a 10-year history of KISS. And he must be writing one chapter a year at the rate he's going right now. So he's doing it in real time. <laughs> No, the best is the kid that that graduated. Was, oh yeah, there was there was a kid that that graduated and got his master's. Yeah, I saw that. In, <laughs> in less time than it took to write the got book. Got his PhD. He went to college, got his PhD in less time. And I don't want to hear anything from any of you knuckleheads complaining that we're dumping on this. It's like it's become a joke, you know. And I so, tell you what, I was I was going through something the other day. I just thought you guys would. I, I actually grabbed it up. How rare is this? This is an actual photo of Gene playing wow. during the Elder. This is a fan taken photo. But uh, and I doubt that'll be in the book. <laughs> <laughs> what book? There will never be a book. Um, all right. So this week's <laughs> returning guest. This week's Geekathon. Geekathon. <laughs> and listen, as soon as we mention his name, it's going to piss some of you off. And that's fine. But still listen. Eddie Trunk is sits down with us this week. Eddie Trunk is back. And boy, do we geek out on some oh. really, I don't know, minutia, what if related to Elder and Creatures of the Night. And we go off to Revenge and... We talk a about Hot in the Shade, and he shares some Ace in observations and some Eric Carr stories. Dude, if you're a KISS fan, listen. Set aside whatever anger you might have. Listen. This is all KISS, Fun. baby. You yeah. This is all KISS. Yeah. And uh, Eddie, double thumbs up. This is a great discussion. I think it goes almost two hours. Well, he's a dork just like us. Exactly. He That's is. why he's so awesome. He fits yeah. right in. I mean, he, so he, he's all in. So it's awesome. Yeah. Just let it roll. Eddie Trunk, we geek out on KISS. And some Aerosmith. Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Hey there, Three Sides fans. Today here in uh, Three Sides World, we are very, very happy and excited to have a uh, matter of fact, I think we got to get him a gold jacket here. This is at least three fourth. or four. This is probably fourth. Um, the one, the only Mr. Eddie Trunk. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Eddie. 
Thank you for having me, guys and lady. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. I think it's my third, but the first on video. Yeah, the first is it? So, okay. You know, with a mug like this, I mean, I'm just made for video. I mean, come on, what a treat to your audience. Hey, you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> People just and, pay attention to Lisa, so don't worry about it. And, 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 right. Eddie, Eddie, before we get into the kiss talk, just quick thank you for asking all of us to come on your show and talk yes. about uh, the, the the best of Kiss solo album. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah we had a good time. That that was, um, well, I appreciate you guys doing it. And I thought of you when I, I you know, I, I contemplated whether to do that on, on my show because I thought like even for Kiss fans, it's a little geeky like you, because there's not a lot of people that are going to get into like every song on all four of those records. So I'm like, is this too niche to even do on the radio? And then I was like, the hell with it. And then I'm like, who else could I like? I knew my audience was going to call in, but I'm like, who could I reach out to? And I thought of of you uh, instantly, all four of you. And then you you all came together. We had a great, you know, I appreciate you doing it. Um, but the thing that blew my mind about that show was that the the day you guys were on, the entire day ended up being artists and like you know, from Rob Zombie to whatever, getting really into that, that I didn't get one listener call, that I took the next two days just listener calls doing these lists. So it's I was great. totally wrong. People were so into doing it. It blew me away, the response it got, and I appreciate you all being a part of it. That's well, awesome. You know, I know. I watched you know it explode. What? I thought this is great. On the reverse, go ahead. Mike, go ahead. I think it was Lisa that was talking. Oh, oh. Talk. No, Lisa, I just honey. thought it was fun. Continue on, gentlemen. <laughs> no, on, on the reverse side, when I brought this topic to Mike, I thought it would be cool to get somebody like yourself on who could get super geeky with this topic because it's partially based in reality. And then the second pace, the second part is based in, you know, fantasy, if you want. Your what if. The what if. But uh, today's topic, and this is why we're so happy to have Eddie on, is we need you guys to, to think back to the beginning of the 1980s. And what spawned all this was, uh, you know, as you guys know, matter of fact, over the weekend, I posted a bunch of clips. But this, is, this one's very intriguing. Uh, if you're, matter of fact, I know, Mike, on Monday, you post the the, the audio only right now I'm holding up an article from Record Mirror, which is a UK based um, uh, newspaper back in the day. And here's what we want to talk about today. Back in 1981, and this is again, this is in print. This is factual. Kiss was approached to headline Donington Monsters of Rock. Now, if you guys know your rock history, that's a huge deal. Um, matter of fact, that year, 1981, ACDC ended up um, headlining that um, festival. So that, that's how big that festival was. So I got to thinking, you know, KISS was approached for that. But on their own homeland, literally two years later, 1983, May 29th, my birthday, by the way, May 29th, 1983, Heavy Metal Day at the US Festival, and uh, what would it have been like, honestly, on Heavy Metal Day, had Kiss been asked to play that festival? Keep in mind, they're coming off, that would have been them coming off the end of the Creatures of the Night Tour. They still had not been to um, Brazil. Um, so they were, they were ready and rocking and rehearsed and what would that have been like? Would, would it have changed their fortunes maybe a little bit earlier? Because as we all know, uh, you know, with the timeline, the fall, that fall, Kiss releases um, Lick It Up and, uh, you know, things got, uh, things got a little better for them. So, so ba basically we've got two what if questions. What if in 1981, in support of The Elder, Kiss went over to, to the UK and played Donington, headline Donington. And then what if in 1983, um, coming off of the Creatures tour, what if they were asked to play the US Festival? 
So before we begin and before we, we, we bring everybody in, I want to read this. It's just a quick article. And I want to read this for the fans, just so just so you guys can 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 understand this. Uh, the headline is, and there's a picture uh, of them in their current at the time, elder outfits. And it just says underneath there, Kiss Donnington headliners. So Kiss to head Donnington. And here's the article. Kiss look set to headline Castle Donnington Monsters of Rock Festival at the end of August. Originally, it was thought Rush would top the bill. But it's understood negotiations have broke down with the Canadian band. The festival organizers have now approached KISS. The band are said to be keen to play the 60,000 seat capacity to reestablish their British market. They also want to promote their controversial concept album, Music from the Elder, released at the end of last year, to mixed critical acclaim. Their appearance at Donington could also be part of a full-scale European tour with the band playing other festival sites in Germany, France, Belgium, and Holland. KISS last played Britain two years ago with shows at Stafford Bingley Hall and Wembley Arena. The Donington gig would be the band's first British outdoor appearance. Record Mirror understands the band are considering a contract offer by the festival organizers and a decision will be made shortly. KISS have spent the last few months working on a new stage and they're also, they've also swapped their outrageous stage clothes for a more futuristic functional look. Also still in the running for appearance at Donington are UFO, the Michael Schenker Group, and Slade. So let's, let's, let, let's let our guest go first on this and, le and let's, let's do it in a timeline. So let's talk about the 81 Donington appearance first. Eddie, what do you think? W if that had happened, what, what comes to mind? Well, hard to say because obviously, uh, well, first of all, would, are we working under the assumption that Ace played it? Yes, would but bailed, have would it have been Vinny? Yes, but we'd also have to talk about the reality that Lisa, what is that in front of your camera? That's my cat. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Because cause I'm curious because like the thing about it is I think that if they would have done it with Ace, say, so say it's like, okay, so we all know the only live elder appearance was Fridays, right? The TV, the, the, that was the only time they actually played live the songs from that record. So, and that was, that was a great lineup of the band, in my opinion, with Ace and Eric Carr. And I think, I think there's a little bit of a question that if that was the band that went over and did that with a cool new stage production, then it could have been a it could have been a pretty cool thing that could have changed the trajectory. The reason why I think Ace is pivotal there is because of the fact that if Ace didn't do it and say he bailed by then, and they had to go and go with Vinny and introduce Vinny sooner, then I think it would have been viewed differently. Whereas if they went over with Ace, it was like okay, here comes the guys with their new drummer who we had already seen already who had already been established, who everybody accepted and liked. So they're coming over like that versus here we are. Oh, and now we just lost another guy and meet this guy and we're playing it. So I think that's just an important distinction that we just don't obviously have an answer to. If it, we know Ace was technically in the band then, but would, would he, you know, where was his, what would, what would the lineup have been? But we, what we do know is when we, we did an episode on the, supposed elder tour they were working on when we we got access to some um artwork from a stage designer yeah and it. and yeah. one of the memos back then when they were planning the tour for the elder one of the memos had a line item for a new guitar player for paying for a new guitar player yep. so it's suspected that back as far as 81 ace was already out of the band they knew he was out of the band. Well, that's why I thought this this whole thing was so interesting to talk about. I mean, 
also too, like I said, you know, going through clips, um, here's a bunch from May of 83. Grant, we're not there yet, but you know, those are the problems that Ace was having, you know, with the yeah, it, it, it really wasn't until 83 that it became public that Ace was not here. He was temporarily replaced. People knew he was out of the band, but but back around the elder, I don't think there was much rumors going on beyond the fact that Ace didn't like the album. Right, but you say he was out of the band, but obviously he did Fridays, um, and he we did. all know we all know that that at that time, if he was contractually like really out, that if there was an offer to go do Monsters of Rock, the first question would have been okay, what's the money? And if the money was right, you know that Ace would have been there. I mean, I can tell you firsthand a half a dozen experiences since I've known Ace and he's been in the band where he has been not doing it. And then in the 11th hour, they came to him with an offer he deemed suitable and did it in the last minute, like shows where he was events he was not supposed to do. And then he did it because they met his number at, at, at the time. Um, so that is kind of a trend going from this point forward with him. And that's why I say it's, it's, it's entirely possible that it would have been with him if they went to him and said, look, you know, equal, equal cut, let's go. Do you want to go play to 80,000 people in England? He might've done, I, I would think, he, I actually think he would have done it, especially if he did the promo for the record and was, you know, he had songs on the record, you know, dark light escape from the Island, all that. So I, 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 I hypothetically, since we're, that's all we're dealing with, think right. it would have been him. And if he did it, I think it, it could have been, it could have changed everything, at least in Europe, because we know the story was radically different for Unmasked throughout the rest of the world and the touring they did for it than it was here in America. So it could have definitely changed, uh, kept that whole thing going for outside of the US at least. What do, what do you think, because it would have been touring in support of the elder, so they obviously would have had to play some elder. But the elder wasn't in, out yet, correct? That no, was, no, it was. It, it was. was. It was. That's that's what this article said. They would be going over there in in hopes right. of maybe promoting the elder. But the elder came out in what November of eighty one. Now, did I? Yeah. Did I? I did I say I, I meant eighty two? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. All right. So this is the next, the following summer. Correct. Correct. Okay. So, great. so my, I guess my question would be, how would that have gone over with fans at Donington if Kiss came out in their elder costumes, cut hair, no boots, toned down image, playing songs that, you know, are are very divisive amongst Kiss fans? Would that, you know, would they have ended up getting? piss bottles thrown at them as, as the Donington crowd goes, what the hell is this? You're not Kiss. Well, let me give you this scenario. Like, and I always envision this if they ever toured for the Elder. House lights go down, you crank fanfare through the PA, the, the lights circling on the stage, cool production, who cares that their hair's cut? That didn't, wasn't a big deal. It was a cool, you know, different look, whatever. And then you do a Kiss set and then to represent that record, you do the oath, you do I, and maybe you do dark light. And the rest is all Kiss classics from 79 back. I mean, that's a killer show to me. I, I don't think they'd come out and play the record in sequence or something. That would be a very different story. But if you right. do what they normally do, which is two, three cuts from the latest record, and then you backload it with like classics with Ace, Eric Carr, Gene Paul, Regardless of what they look like, I think that's a killer show. Oh, I'm with you. The oath has to be the opener on 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 that. And and also too, you know, that was really and this is the, you know timelines everything, especially over there. That was in the frenzy of the new wave of British heavy metal. I mean, a song like the oath would have been very well received. Um, I mean, you play Odyssey, there might have been a problem. Yeah, correct, correct. <laughs> or yeah. just a boy. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, logistically speaking, that, you know, that had Ace, see, this is the, this is what I find fascinating about this. Um, and, and again, you know, just going through my, my stuff, here's, here's two things that tie in. Again, you know, th this article, this is from performance, and this is from Bill of Coins 
um, personal archive. Um, it just says, I don't know if you can see this, it says Bill FYI, and there's the date, May of 82. Okay, now keep in mind, this is probably just prior to this sort of thing, you know, happening. Right on uh, page 17, I mean, keep in mind, if you guys don't know, performance is a, is a trade. It's an industry touring magazine. Correct. And I'll read this little paragraph to you. And it's, and it's got like circles and stars around it, you know. Um, rumors are flying that Ace Freely may be the next man behind the grease paint to exit Kiss. Freely was AWOL for taping of a Flo and Eddie TV special. And manager Bill, and they call him Bill Asin, we know it's Bill Coin himself has been letting it be known in stage whispers that he's looking to handle a heavy metal, another heavy metal guitarist. Stay tuned. So as we know from the episode we did with those earlier documents, they put on the, on their spreadsheet, you know, lead guitar player gets two grand a week or whatever the, so I think when historically or historically, this is probably why that didn't happen because like Eddie was saying, that would have made total sense if you wanted to try and get this record off the ground. You would have had to have played a big place like this and you could have debuted your show over there. And, you know, they could have maybe resurrected their career somehow. Would that, would that have this? reflected back into the U.S. though? Maybe. I doubt it. I, well, yeah, I don't think so. Have, yeah, we don't have what we have now, but isn't this also during the whole time frame when they're trying to get a new record deal because Mercury's taking over Casablanca just to add to more problems to this whole thing? I mean, I think, I mean, I think from, I think that that album, as polarizing as it is to fans and, and everyone, that that, that that album was so polarizing and let's be honest at the time by most tremendously disliked and panned in most reviews and just so not considered to be like what kiss should be doing um that i think it was just a case of like we got to fold our tent and get on with the next as quick as possible and if we're losing the guitarist let's lose them but let's get on to getting back to making whatever fans we still have left happy, which of course we all know the response to that was Creatures, which turned out to be, even though a commercial disaster, really reaffirming of their whole career. And in my opinion, one of the best records they ever made. So I, I, think, I think that the, like, it's curious to wonder and to, and to, it would be great to find out why they didn't accept doing this. Was it a falling out of, over money? Was it because of the situation with the lineup in flux? Or was it the fact that we all know they had all these grand plans for the elder from the movie to the big stage to all these things that were all just done when the record tanked. So I think this was probably just another piece of that. They just said, you know what, forget it. We're not doing anything. Let's just focus on the next thing. That would be my speculation as to why it happened. Um, but of course we don't really know. But how popular were they from a record sales standpoint in Europe versus America? So it probably, is it possible that the Donington Festival could have had more impact for them over there with the fans? Oh yes, I, I think it definitely could have had more impact in Europe. I mean, and, and again, if you look back, the labels over in Europe were doing not a, a huge amount around the elder, but you were seeing elder ads in Kerrang and you were seeing elder ads in print and they were doing elder 45s. You remember that, you know, I've got that one where you, you move Gene's tongue in and out. Yeah. You know, they, they were doing more for the elder over there than was ever done over here. But I think to Eddie's point, they may have just looked at this and go, okay, so we, we invest all this money to get Ace back on board. It's going to cost us more to keep Ace here. We're going to have to put together a tour. We're going to go over and do it in Europe, and it's going to give us a little bump in Europe. But at the end of the day, somebody probably said, it's not going to translate back in the U.S. And ultimately, that's where the money comes from, is back in the U.S. 
So scrap it. Let's go back to our roots. Let's get focused and let's end up with creatures. And see, here's the other thing. Like when you talk about the unmasked period, I went to the one show they did for unmasked. I was at the Palladium show in New York oh. and, and coming out of that show, it was like Eric Carr's first show. It, the, the feeling was like, okay, they're going to just go from here. And even if it's smaller places, they're going to really reestablish this band and it's going to be great. And we, everyone, everyone came out of the Palladium that night, even though it was 41, 40 years ago, I still remember there was a genuine buzz again. Like it was like a real feeling like, wow, they're back and this is great. And this new drummer is going to be awesome. And this is going to be like, it's going to like the U S is going to get kicked in the ass all over again by kiss. And we all know that that didn't happen, but we also know that unmasked that part of the reason that didn't happen is unmasked was a total stiff in the U S got no airplay, no hit. And then we see this footage of like them playing Australia and these other places and Shandy's a hit and talk to me's a hit. And they're having playing these huge crowds with the elder and that period of time. What's, what's interesting is, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not aware of anything from the elder in any market in the world doing well. Like globally, there was there wasn't like oh Shandy was Holland. a big hit in Australia. There wasn't that moment on that record anywhere that I'm aware of. I think Holland. Uh, I, I'd have to check, but you, you're. I mean, don't get me wrong. But you did ask. You like did did it did it get? I, I think. I think I'm going to have to check. Also, too, I want to correct myself. I made a huge faux pas. I, I listed the 1981 Monsters of Rock um, with ACDC. I was wrong. I look at this bill now, which was the 82 Monster of Rock. It's not that impressive. I don't know if you guys can. Can you see that? Status quo, Saxon, Hawkwind, Uriah Heap, and Anvil. That status quo is huge over there. Status yes, quo yes, is a, a totally different thing there than. But but yeah, I agree. It's not like oh my god, but you do got to keep that in context because status quo is one of those bands they worship in England that yes. nobody cares about. You here. know, and 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 Eddie, to your point, it would be fun to find out what eventually happened to cause this not to happen. Did it maybe get can't did the. The, the carpet get pulled out from under kiss on this maybe by donnington maybe they ended up looking at this going you know yeah it's kiss but kiss is nothing anywhere right now and we can get status quo we can get a big uk band to come in here and make this a big deal i mean it's hard to say i you can say kiss is nothing but to me like if this we were talking about a festival that was happening in america i'd be with you but given the fact that kiss did business and did people they, like 1980 the unmasked tour did do well in most places and the lineup was well received and the band was really good then i don't know if that same perception of like kiss is a dead issue would have been in england um so i think that they would have been a little bit more I don't think it was like a billing, do they matter thing so much as I, again, we're all speculating, but if I'm speculating, I'm saying it's more of a case of a coin and the label and everyone saying this thing's a disaster. I mean, anything you've ever read about the elder in that period of time, like the, from the minute they had the listening party for the record, it was like, oh my God, this is like, what did a we mistake. do? It was a that mistake. That it was just fold your tent and let's forget this ever happened. I yeah. It's funny, this review is uh, they combined ACDC for those about to rock and the elder. And, and I'm just guessing this is either out of Record World or, or Hit Parader or something. But you're absolutely right. And, and basically what the article is saying is, you know, Kiss is the past, you know, ACDC's the future. And the funny part is arguably they were right around the same time period. You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, Kiss was certainly seen to have uh, lost their their step but you know it goes back though to that original article though now keep in mind rush was just starting to get big in europe in 1980 um 81 so the fact that you know the the festival was headlined the year previous by acdc they were talking about rush you know um 
put Kiss in there. I mean, I think that's the way those festival organizers looked at it. I mean, we over here in America knew they were dead. But as as somebody who collects, you know, sounds and Kerrang magazines and stuff like that, they Kiss still you could still find articles on Kiss. They weren't they weren't laughed at like they were literally in they were laughed out of cream. Fuck in nineteen eighty one. That's when they first posted those pictures of them um, you know, without makeup and basically making fun of them. And that was, you know, that was really you know, biting the hand that feeds you in many ways, because, you know, the, as the old saying was, uh, you know, cream sold kiss and kiss sold cream. Um, you know what I mean? And then magazines like circus uh, and, and stuff, they, they just weren't taking kiss seriously, but in Europe, the, the, the rock press, which was really on the rise back then, uh, you know, thanks to sounds and, and Kerrang and, and stuff like that. Kiss was still talked about, you know, openly, and you could still like them without, as much garbage as we got here in the United States. But, you know, I, I, I really, the more I think about this, especially looking at that bill, I, I think KISS could have really helped themselves playing that festival. But of also, though, too, you know, go back to the reality of it all. Everything that we know now from, um, you know, these articles and things we saw from Jacques Auction, <laughs> They were in bad shape, man. Yeah. Also, too. I, ahead, I was just I was just going to say, you know, but could it help themselves? Because let, let's be honest, as to as to Tommy indicated, it's, it was a different time back then. If this got had gone over well in the UK in support of the elder, that doesn't come back to the US shores. That doesn't translate back into the US. Let look. Look at how well they were doing in Australia and New Zealand on Unmasked. That didn't translate for crap back into the yeah, US. That's a really that that's a really important point because again, when you guys always talk about timeline and you're so right to do that, back then information didn't travel like it does now. There was no tweeting, there was no texting, yep. there was no internet, there was no immediate like, oh my God, look what just happened here. Here's video of it. So none of that existed. Here's the other thing I'd say too when we're talking about the timeline. So I've been to Monsters of Rock a couple times. Uh, I was there the year actually that Paul got up and played with Bon Jovi. And I was there, there the year Kiss played it, opening for Iron Maiden on Crazy Nights. And you're talking about Monsters of Rock 81, 82-ish, when that whole thing started only a year earlier. So the, the festival was only two, three years in, and it was a... It was a it was a, a big deal in England, but it's not the way it's looked at now. For people that don't know, Monsters of Rock has evolved into what's now called Download, and it's in this at the same site, and it's three days, and it's you know fifty thousand people a day, and all that. Back then, it was one day, same spot, but one day, Monsters of Rock, two three years in, and maybe twenty five thirty thousand people, to my knowledge, especially in what was only its second or third year. Because the first year of it, there's a record for it. I have it. Rainbow headlines. And it was the down to earth tour. So it would have been 80. So my point about the impact of what this would have done for KISS if they hypothetically played it with whoever they played it with, I think we got to remember that the, the hit off of it might not be, even if they turned in a great show, what we think given no social media, no internet, and still a budding festival at that time. It wasn't this behemoth that it is now. Yeah, Do you I, think I, they could I, have created their, their, their career over there, though, maybe for a year or two to try and get some legs? I, I'm, I'm, again, since this is all hypothetical, say Kiss did play that and it went over a storm, as they say, over across the pond. Do you then concentrate that market for the next record i mean that's another thing too in the summer of 82 they were putting creatures back together they knew what they had to do you know what i mean that's why i find this so fascinating yeah and i think that i think mark the key point what you say say is how they go over so for dealing in all the hypotheticals if they turn in an unbelievable performance and they bring the house down and it's great that's very possible because the one thing we all know to this day the British press actually still holds weight 
And like, so if you turn in a great performance, it can make you. And if you, if you tank it or you're just not good, they, it can crush you for years over there. They, it's still like that. I was there, like, I went to Monsters, I will, will now download. I was there like five years ago and Marilyn Manson played and he was just hammered and falling down on stage. And it, it, like, he couldn't, like, they didn't forgive him for it for like two, three years. It, he, he had to, do everything to rebuild his career there because they really, he was just a mess. So a lot of it comes down to, that's why I asked who's in the band, what are they playing? What's the set list? And like, you know, are they bringing it? Are they doing, are they going to crush it? And if they do, then yeah, you could see a scenario where they work the next couple of years over there a little bit more because they would have had some momentum. But, you know, Eddie, I, I think you're right, though. I mean, I think, you know, once once the the writing was on the wall that the Elder as an album was a complete failure from the moment they turned it into the record label, I think Gene, Paul and Bill Coin were probably like, just get this behind us as quick as possible and let's regroup and rebuild. And they have to rebuild for the U.S. I mean, that's that. That's what makes or breaks your career. I and mean, wasn't that what Kiss Killers was? Wasn't that was the, Kiss Killers that quick band-aid yep. to say, here's four great new songs and here's a reminder of how great our old shit was. Yep. I mean, that's exactly. what Killers was, was the yeah. bridge to all that. So to me, that was the immediate thing. And interestingly, Killers came out in those markets. That's what I was going to talk about. They, they did tailor that to the European market. It wasn't released here. You know what I mean? That that what you just said is exactly kind of what I was saying. I mean, was could they have because the writing was more than on the wall here? It was it was stamped on their foreheads, um, you know. But but fortunately though too, I mean, and which we're going to get to in a little little bit. Word of mouth eventually spreads. Creatures a great example because it didn't sell very well, but metalheads started going, hey. <laughs> that band I grew up with that used to play kick-ass rock and roll is playing kick-ass rock and roll again. I, I think most people, especially people our age, were super happy when they got Creatures. It was a, a really a hallelujah moment. I know I certainly had that, and I remember telling all my friends, and of course, some of which didn't care at that point, but others did. And, uh, you know, the but, you know, I, I think I think, again, that hallelujah moment was for us hardcores that never gave up through all of the crap we went through oh, sure. from from the solo albums all the way through the elder sales of the album creatures and ticket sales of the tour which got canceled early indicate that overall most people said i don't give a crap guys i'm sure you know this but and it kills me to this day i never saw the creatures tour because they did not play this market, like their hometown market, New York City. They did not play. The closest they came was the Centrum in Worcester, Mass., which is, you know, five-hour drive. And I yeah. actually bought a ticket to go with my friends, and I had an appendix attack and couldn't go, and they went. But I never saw them because they never th – think about that. They, they never played their hometown market for Creatures. It's crazy. That's crazy. Well, and yeah. for me, Creatures was nothing more than another left tour, left turn, just like The Elder was, just like Unmasked was. I was glad, and I love it. It's one of my all-time favorite Kiss records, but to me, it was just one more oddity. So on one hand, I was like thrilled that they're back and they're playing heavy music, but at the same time, that heavy music changed. It doesn't sound anything like Love Gun or Rock and Roll Over. Now it's a heavy metal band that's much more like the British and Metal Invasion than it was you know i don't know so for me it was like it was great but at the same time still confusing it was definitely an overcompensation to the fact that the elder was the elder where they yeah. went so hard the other way in response to it to the point that i had the poster forever i'm sure you guys did too the loudest band, loudest in, the band in the world on that poster yep. And, yep. and you know the single i love it loud and suddenly they were identifying as a metal band, which they never did before. And right. I never thought Kiss was a metal band. They were always a hard rock band to me. They yep. probably would have been better served staying in the mode of the songs on Killers in terms of just 
pleasing the audience because yeah. you're you're right tommy i mean nobody ever really talks about that but in some ways creatures was just as much of a of a a, a, a knee jerk the other way from what the elder was because it really was a, like a little uh disingenuous to what kiss always was it was we all i mean i'm sure we all love their i love the record but it's just when you look at it in retrospect, it was way heavier than anything they ever did. And, and it was Kiss, I think, I've always said that like in the 70s, Kiss were innovators and they set the trends and everyone followed them from staging to yeah. merchandising to all that. Around that time, that's the time to me where Kiss became followers. And that continued like, okay, we need our Eddie Van Halen guy. So we get Vinnie Vincent and fire him because he's overplaying. We get Mark St. John, we fire him because he plays too much and then gets sick. But so they, they're hiring guys that are like their Eddie Van Halen, but that doesn't fit Kiss. And then you right. look further and like, okay, we want our Bon Jovi moment. So now we're doing Crazy Nights with Ron Nevison. And then we want our Def Leppard moment. So we're doing Read My Body on Hot in the Shade. Like, it's like, you can see they, they were chasing it as opposed to just being true to what they established. And you could make the argument that maybe that started with creatures around the time, a lot of metal bands coming out, Maiden, yeah. Priest starting to get a lot of traction. Let's jump on that and reclaim that turf. Real quick on this, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this. I didn't know this. Last week on my radio show, I had Brian Adams on as a guest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I asked him about co-writing War Machine and Rock and Roll Hell. Have you, have you ever heard about that and how that happened? Share it, share it with our listeners. Please share it, because I don't. Well, I he just said that he was a, a... there was So Brian Adams played a show in New York around that time at a club called The Bottom Line. And his second record, or third record, actually, Cuts Like a Knife, was just about to come out. He was touring for it. And there was a buzz on him at that point as this aspiring, as this rising songwriter guitar player singer whatever and i love that record it's a great record yeah. and at that time he was spending a lot of time in new york writing with people and trying to get gigs as a songwriter until his own career got going to make some money so he he uh he plays this show at the bottom line and it was like this i have friends that went to it i couldn't go because i was too young my parents wouldn't let me but my friends went there and they were calling me from the payphone because they're like Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley are here. Mick Jagger is here. Like all these heavy duty dudes went to see Brian Adams in this club, who at that point was kind of unknown. And they liked, you know, everyone really liked what he was doing. There was a great buzz on him. And uh, I guess the story goes that like, he somehow connected with them. And he told me that War Machine, the riff to War Machine, was Gene's. That's Gene's riff. And Gene okay. sent him the riff and said, see what you can come up with with this and see what you can make of this for me. And uh, maybe we'll do something with it. So he, he takes the riff and Jim Valance, who has been Brian Adams co-writer on almost every song, brings it to Jim. They sit down, they work on the riff. If people want to hear this, it's on, it's going to be, actually, it's going to be on my podcast um, next week, but it's on the Sirius XM app. Okay, so tune tune in, guys. Well, it's already by, aired live, but yeah. By, by, by the time the this app. by the time this episode oh, is out, right. it'll uh, be available. Okay, so it's on the podcast. So anyway, he this is fa this blew my mind. So Brian Adams says, say he takes it to Valance. They hear the riff, and they say, "Let's this is for Kiss. Let's come up with something that's big and cinematic and has a feel to it, and that could really work live." So they write the rest of the song, as we know it, War Machine. They send the demo to Gene, Gene loves it, they record it. Brian Adams did not know until I told him last week that that song is a live staple in the Kiss set. He had no idea. Brian Adams to this day has never seen Kiss live. And he, he was blown away because he said, we wrote it with the intent of it being this big thing in their show and I had no idea they actually do it live. I go, not only do they actually do it live, they still do it live. It's like, it's a feature part of the show. He's like, that's incredible. And then 
Rock and Roll Hell, which I did not know, was a cover. BTO? They, they, had, they had written it for, for BTO. And uh, I did not know that he, because because if you listen to the interview, he casually mentions, um, he goes, oh, yeah, and then they just covered Rock and Roll Hell. And I'm like, whoa, 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 that was around already? He goes, oh, yeah, we had written that before, which I did not know that. But, That's um, quite and a bit course, different. Quite and then, of course, different. Eric Carr has a co-write on Cuts Like a Knife right. on a track called Don't Leave Me Lonely. And I asked Brian about that. And he said, same deal, same time. He was in New York working with some people. He said, Eric was a really talented guy. He was, you know, wanted to try to get some songs out there. They wrote this. Uh, Eric brought an idea in for that song. They finished it off. Kiss didn't want to do it. So Brian's like, I'll record it. And that's how it ended up on Cuts Like a Knife. But I never knew about that. It's really fascinating to me. Wow. Well, yeah, I love that, the, the way that everything ties in. And I think, at least from my perspective, and most of the people that listen know this, I'm not a heavy metal guy. I grew up on R&B, 50s and 60s, pop, 70s and 80s, and all of that. So to me, like we were talking the other week about Peter Chris's solo record, I wasn't disappointed by it because I didn't expect anything from him. And I didn't know what to expect when Creatures came out. And I was pleasantly surprised because the songs are really good. But at the same time, I'm thinking, well, why didn't they get like a Punky Meadows or someone that I thought fit their guitar sound better than, a, a, you know, a flash guitar player like Vinnie Vincent? But what Eddie said is that he, the reality is Creatures is when they started chasing trends. So the, True. The, the oh, trend I, I get then why they was did to go it. after the, you know, the Eddie Van Halen Randy Rhodes, that that type of guitar player, not not an Ace Frehley clone. That's what always blew my mind about that is is the fact that I saw a bunch of shows on the Lick It Up tour. I, I, they played a couple nights at Radio City Music Hall, and I, I I was right in the front, and like Paul, like and Vinny visibly on stage argued and and yelled at each other more than one time. Because Vinny would, you know, Paul would do this call and repeat thing with the audience and Vinny would do these like shredding things in between. And Vinny would take it like a whole extra couple measures and Paul would just look at him. I remember like yesterday, Paul, I'm right in front of Paul's mic. I'm right against the stage. And Paul just turns to, to Vinny and he goes, you watch, you fucking watch like that. Because he wasn't watching for the cue and instead just like, you know, showing off. So you just knew it was going to implode. It, you had one guy just on this trip of like wanting to shred his ass off and the other guy still trying to keep it kiss. But the fun, the, the thing that always blew my mind about that is, okay, so you cut ties with Vinny, but then you go get Mark St. John, who, who's the same, same thing, thing, like a, a million one. miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, but I suppose, again, to the point that you made, it is, they were chasing it. Finally, I felt revenge. They stopped chasing and started their own. They finally found themselves to me when that record came out. And then Carnival I, of Souls, they started chasing. Chasing again. again. Yeah. But I think with revenge, I, when you say found themselves, I just think Gene finally returned to the fold. Yeah. Well, and it whatever. like but made the still... universe, it made the Kiss universe well, they oh, found they found band. Kiss as a band. It wasn't the Paul Stanley solo project. Yeah. Look, I, I, I knew I know I know we're all over the map here, which I knew was going to happen because we're all just like <laughs> yep. on a million things. But I I'm when the I'm in the rare minority when it comes to revenge that I think it's insanely overrated. Um, Boy, look at the time, Eddie. Been oh, great. Eddie! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dis. Don't get me wrong. I don't dislike the record. It's not like I don't listen to it. But I, I just, I don't know, I just think when I look at the non-original, non-makeup years, I think Asylum's the best record in retrospect. I think Asylum, Asylum oh, is incredibly oh, underrated. Yeah. Underrated. I mean, too many KISS fans judge Asylum by the costumes they wore. That was yeah. it. They don't listen to the music. And you're 100% right, Eddie. Asylum was like was was an incredible album i think what revenge was for me coming off of off of um hot in the shade which that album was a huge letdown for me the tour was incredible but the album was a letdown was almost like how creatures was refreshing from the elder it was okay now we're back to a great 
album again. It just sounds like a band. It sounds like it was, I mean, it was produced. They actually got a producer for Revenge instead of Hot in the Shade, which was self-produced, and basically polished up demos. So it felt like, okay, my band is back again, is all Revenge really was for me. Everything started to feel good. And, 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 it, and it's interesting how Revenge and Creatures bookend two dramatic changes in the band's career. I mean, they're albums that, for the most part, most fans applaud and love, but they also are, are albums that indicate big changes in the band. Creatures yeah, coming I mean, out of Elder, going into no makeup, and Revenge basically saying, okay, we're back, but now the makeup's coming back, and we're going to become, you know, a, a, a band that's paying tribute to our past. Yeah, I mean, make no mistake, I don't dislike Revenge, and I don't, it's not like I, I hate the album or anything like that. I just hear that album come up so much with people saying it's the best non-original record, or it's in the top three all-time Kiss records. I just don't feel that way about it at all. I think it's in the middle of the pack somewhere. There's stuff like Paralyzed and stuff on there. It's like, eh, oh, whatever. See, I don't like a lot of that stuff either, but there's four or five really strong songs on that record that I love so much that it puts it into that category for me because i don't like paralyzed i don't like spit i don't like any of oh, that oh my it's, god it's mostly... the rewrite of the first cut is the deepest with every time i look at you I, that they yeah, got that, sued yeah, over that's the only song but, i don't like really yeah, that's I like the same it. one i don't like that one either that much so it's... that's how i judge a record because i can't remember the last time i had a record come out where I, other than cheap trick where i i love every song hot you in know the shade, if it was if there were five less songs on hot in the shade and they, they made it in better. a real studio and had a real mix and real drums. And a that real could have been a very different record. Yes, I agree. Absolutely. Way too you long. Know. I remember I was very close with Eric Carr, as some, so most people know. And I was with Eric in L.A. when they were recording that. And I remember him being so disappointed. Like, I picked him up from the studio one day. And I'm like, how's it going? And he's just like they're putting samples on the drums and they're, we're using this shitty little demo studio and they're putting too many. So, I mean, he was really down on it and he was never usually like that even privately at that time. He's just like, yeah, man, my drums are like neutered and it's just, it's just, you know, it's, the, it's not what we should be doing. And he was, I, I remember they kept saying the studio was like a demo studio. It was like one of the shittiest studios in LA because they were trying to save money or something at the time. Well, there's 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 two things. Number one, and I I, I, I can't get into it, but I, some of those drums on that record are not Eric Carr. I'm just gonna playing or a machine. They're a machine, right? Well, I'm just saying, some of those drums are not Eric Carr. That's that's, that's all I'm gonna get into here. Oh, um, come on, no, I, no, <laughs> he does this shit all the I, time. I, I, but no, Is it Kevin look, Valentine. Like I said, some of those songs are, <laughs> are not they, Eric Mark, Carr. Mark, Mark, can you at least say some of those songs that are not Eric Carr or are a man or a machine? Can you say man or machine? Some of those songs are not Eric Carr. Just letting you know. No, it's Eric Stanger, no, then. That's what so, number, so number two in that, I, Revenge is so special because that was really one of the greatest, absolutely greatest times. So maybe that... I, it, but see, I do love the whole record. But that moment, 92, let me tell you, just the fucking diehards were left. And that was when the Kiss Expos were really taking off. I was just going to say that, Mark, about the Kiss it, Expos. That's what I mean. And Revenge was really like all us fucking total Kiss nerds going, yeah, the new album's great, and we're all here. And we're well, uh, all of what I said, uh, how it compares to Creatures for me. It was, I, I remember when, when, when Revenge was coming out, I was working at a small record label, Red Light Records, and I got, I knew somebody at the label, and they'd sent me an advance of Revenge, and I played it. And at the time on our label, um, we had Crowbar, Kirk Winstein's band. Mm -hmm. And Kirk's a huge Kiss fan, huge. And we were on the phone and I'm like, Kirk, I just got, got the advance of revenge. And he's kind of like, yeah, okay. Coming out of a hot in the shade, how is it? I go, dude, this is freaking phenomenal. They're back. 
to Mark's point, they're back. They're rocking. The guitars. Gene is here. It's dirty. It's raw. It's Look, evil. When Unholy, when Unholy hit, yeah. it was like, oh, my God. This is, it was the same, like you said, Michael, it's the same feeling I had when I first dropped the needle on Creatures. I'm like, fuck, I, you know, I had, it's, my band's back. And it was great because at that time, though, that was really when the, I don't know what you'd want to call it, the, that's when all the conventions were really in swing. And man, it was just so cool. That was, uh, to me, honest to God, that was the best time being a Kiss fan. I'm going to say the best overall. That revenge era, when we were traveling in packs of fans and I was meeting all these people who have, you know, I've been friends with ever since, that that was an exciting generic that's it's a gen it was so generic everybody who loved kiss and who went to those conventions there was no bullshit about it people weren't buying stuff to to sell on ebay or any of that fucking everybody who came to a kiss convention in the early 90s before the pre-reunion was there because they loved the band and you could just sit and talk your ass off kiss well, Eddie, you went to some of those things. Those you're talking crazy. about you're talking about the you're talking about the sanctioned ones, the ones they did, not like the Richie no, Rano no, no, ones. No, 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 we're talking about the Richie Rano ones. Richie Rano. Oh yeah, God is it? I would. Well, I went to the sanctioned one and the Richie Rano ones. I mean, I was at a million of those. That's what I mean. I, but, I, I, I brought his to one. I was? brought Eric Carr to one. Yeah. I was. Uh, I, I I myself later on when I started to get well known, did a couple signing things there. I was. I was always at those ones with Richie. I wasn't at any of the ones when they got raided by Gene and Paul, unfortunately. That was but, here in uh, Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a but, whole uh, other episode. But, you know, I was just thinking of that time, too, because I was working in the business then, so it was, like, different for me. Like, so let me ask you guys if you remember this. I actually have this somewhere. First of all, I've got a, a, a Smashes, Thrashes, and Hits jacket with my name on it, which is really cool. It's like leather sleeves. They had those going around, but maybe the, the coolest thing they had, which I got to find it, was the the Kiss uh, Platinum card. Did you yes. guys ever see these? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Where yeah. it was given to VIPs or whatever with a phone number on the back. Mm -hmm. And if you called any city, any time, two tickets, two passes to go to any show. And it, it had your name on it. The coolest thing. And, um, you know, I was friends with Eric at that time, so I didn't ever use it. I still have, I'd love to see what would happen if I tried to call the number now. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> it just explode on me. <laughs> you get some do that on your side of my house. <laughs> Eddie, you'll get some like phone sex line at this point, probably. <laughs> <laughs> because the big thing about it was, um, you know, lifetime membership. Like yep. you're, like, yeah. it, was, it was right on, you're deemed for life to have this. And something tells me my my thing was revoked no matter what. Well, you know, you know, I, I, I do recall like years ago hearing from some fan who acquired one and basically they they got hold of Kiss and said, I've got this. And Kiss said, Oh, that doesn't work anymore. And they went back and forth and, and basically <laughs> Kiss said, Look, we'll give you two tickets for the show, but it no longer works after that. <laughs> done. One and done. One and one done. And done. <laughs> Those actually came in the little silver, like it had like a little card or booklet or a card. Yes. Yep. I got to find mine. I, I just went through my stuff and I found a bunch of stuff. I found the press kit for the uh, reunion tour with the VHS the in one. it, yeah, in yeah. the box. I found all that. Found a picture of me and Paul Stanley at the uh, after party from the, I posted on my Instagram from the uh, Asylum tour. After they played Asylum at, at New York, in New York, they had an after party at the Playboy Club. So it's just like great memories that come back around that time. And do you guys remember the press release? And again, I know we're jumping around, but when we were talking about creatures before, do you know they actually put out a press release saying that Vinny was temporary? Mm -hmm. and yeah, I remember that. Rejoining yep. on the tour. Yep. I have it somewhere. I remember that. Yeah, I've, I've that, 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 that was the first excuse was ace i i don't know if they tied it into his car accident or something yeah. but you know he was injured he's recuperating he can't go out on the initial few dates on the tour so we've got a temporary guitarist vinnie vincent who's going out instead yeah and we all knew like okay is this the show he's going to come back and it was just like and then they'd even play new york and yeah well so well, so, early so 
I was just going to say, so while we're back on creatures, reeling the show back into Mark's topic, <laughs> um, let's wait. Let's, do you remember? No, just <laughs> let, let's let's talk about that. What if related to Kiss around the Creatures era and the Us Festival? I mean, first of all, I guess the question is, could it have even happened? I mean, in, in my opinion, is in the reality of the world of Kiss at that time. I don't think they were ever in consideration for the US Festival, ever, ever, ever in consideration to play the US Festival. You know, the music business had given up on KISS at that point in time. The promoters knew what they were selling coming off of the Creatures Tour. Why would you put KISS in to headline, you know, this major event? Because let's be honest. Oh, not headline, Michael, just participate. But here's the thing to that. I was just going to say, I don't see Kiss doing that unless they could headline. If they had to play the middle of the Us Festival, they wouldn't have done it. That would that would just be like admitting we're no longer big and mighty Kiss anymore. Sorry, you know this band Van Halen is now officially. Well, well, hold on, hold on. This is this is the interesting part. Kiss. I'm talking now. If you were to ask Gene and Paul and blah blah blah. They would, they would have argued they're bigger than Triumph. Triumph was playing Kobo, just like, you know, I saw Triumph on that tour. I, I love Triumph. They were bigger than the Motley, you know, um, who just literally opened for them three months earlier. Um, two months earlier, actually. Um, so that was when I was starting to think about this. I'm like, if, if Kiss somehow got in there by some crazy way, they a couldn't have headlined. I mean that that was Van Halen's. You know there was no there was nobody bigger on the planet in hard rock at that moment than Van Halen. Um, but you would say you know they where would they have fitted? I would have said midday because Ozzy at the time was exploding. Um, when Scorpions was, on there. Scorpions, Judas Priest. They'd go on. They're going to be pretty group. low down that year. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. If if they did this, where would they have been? Because would have never. Gene and Paul would have never done that. Just it's. I no way. I mean, to to do that is to admit, Kiss will forever be a theater band from this point forward. We are not big enough to sell a headline tour across arenas. That I mean that I mean, that. That's what they've got to keep that image, that perception up there. So it's better to not even do the show and keep the perception well, to, than do the show broke, and destroy it. Scorps, Scorps broke big the, the next year in 84. Keep, keep in mind, this is May of 1983. But so did Kiss once Lick It Up came out in the fall correct, of 1983. Correct, but so but I, want you to put, I want you to put yourself back in May of 1983. Because I, you know, I look at stuff like this, especially if you're, you know, an American, you know, especially me as being a Detroit kid, you know, I saw Kiss literally months earlier on the Creatures tour at Kobo. Mm -hmm. They were still, you know, kind of in that discussion, but that's what I thought was so odd was, and again, I'm going to expand this a little bit. Um, literally the day after the US Festival, May 30th, I saw Aerosmith that day with the you know with, with jimmy crespo and rick dufay pine knob was pine knob had held like twelve thousand. it was pretty much sold out or pretty close my point is bands like kiss and aerosmith though didn't even get a sniff they didn't even seem like it wasn't even, no one even talked about them it being out of place that they weren't there i mean because i really think look because I think you have to really factor in perception here as a big part of this. So Scorpions, although they had been around for 10 years already, they, they were viewed as a new band on the rise in yeah. America. They were just, they were really going up the ladder. So was Motley, second record, but huge buzz on the rise. Van Halen at the peak. Hold on, was Kiss, Shout Out yet? Uh, no, but it was about to come so. out, I believe. Correct, but they did correct. songs from it. Yes, but. Correct. But but they but you know Quiet Riot was on too who were 
you know, huge yeah. with, with uh, that, with mental health. So everything is like on the rise. And when you look at Kiss and Aerosmith at that time, although you could make the arguments for the quality of the bands and what they were doing, I mean, I'm a huge Aerosmith fan. I actually love the Rock and the Hard Place record. And I think Me that's too. a pretty interesting period with Crespo. But um, regardless of how we felt about it, the perception of Kiss and Aerosmith at that time is damaged goods, old yep. news, yep. not a band, neither band is, had, both bands had their biggest days are over and that's old news. So every, all these festivals want either the biggest thing or the stuff that appears to be on the rise that is, is causing buzz and both Kiss and Aerosmith at that time would have been just considered like old news and washed up. I mean, I mean, again, and we've said this so many times, go back. We were all here. So you go back and remember that period. Kiss was being laughed at. Kiss was being laughed at in the U.S. Doesn't matter. Creatures was a great album. The tour was amazing. But outside of the, the you know, the five to eight to nine thousand Kiss fans that stuck to it, the rest of the music business was laughing at Kiss. That's why the mute, the makeup had to come off. They were I mean, think about think about this, which I've, I've referenced this so many times for people that didn't live through it like we did because we're old enough to have lived through it for younger people and stuff like they like I was I was die hard through it all like I like, you know, up until, you know, up until the first farewell tour, I'm fully in lock, stock and barrel on everything. And you're right. I mean, it was you were. I tell people all the time, like, if I wasn't a big guy, I would have physically gotten my ass beat for liking Kiss and being vocal about it. Like, for, like, I went to, I graduated high school in 82. So 80, 81, 82, I would write, have a Kiss sticker on my notebook or wear a Kiss shirt. And people would literally, they wouldn't fight me, but they'd want to, they'd push into me. That's how bad yep. it was. Yep. So, and then when you think about, Think about this, and I have this somewhere. Billboard magazine, when Lick It Up went gold, a Polygram took out a full page ad with just the oh. Lick It Up record, and it just said Lick It Up gold. Now, to us at that time, that was a huge deal because we're like, yes, we're on the way back. But if you think about how pathetic that is, that a few years earlier, they're shipping double platinum on records but they're taking out an industry trade to say they just made it to gold. Like that just shows how much the, the climb and how hard the climb was back. But then I wonder too, let's say we change it and, and, and say that the US Festival was in 1984 rather than 1983. Is non-makeup kiss a different entity than makeup yes. kiss? Because yes, over, I think it would have went over better. Yeah. Because oh, yeah. over in Europe, they were playing those larger festivals where Iron Maiden or someone else was headlining. So maybe they would have played the US Festival in 84 and not been the headliner, but been in the evening. And that would have changed I everything. Still, I still don't think Gene and Paul would would have accepted a middle slot. No but way. I, I, think, I think after Lick It Up came out, there at least probably could have been discussions and consideration to have Kiss headline or a co-headline at the worst case but it, yes i think at least once the makeup came off they are now back in acceptance let's put it that way but a, a mid slot will never happen kit gene and again gene and paul would see accepting a middle slot as we are no longer big enough we are no longer the big boys I mean, the fact that they went on before Iron Maiden at Monsters of Rock was a big deal. Huge. That, that, that was a that big they deal. Went on, I mean, the fact that they sucked it up and did that was a big, a big thing that they really struggled with, I, I had heard. So there's that. But I got to tell you, Mike, I, I don't like. OK, so you talk you're talking about okay, when the US Festival happened, was Lick It Up out yet? No, no. OK, so you're talking. So you're going to, so, so hypothetically with what we're doing here, they could have conceivably played it in makeup. That's what it would that have been. The, that's the whole point of the exercise before they played their last show in makeup at that point in June down south of the border. 
This is May of 83. So they, yeah, so they hadn't even played South America yet. They would have been done with their U.S. tour, gearing up to go to South America. It That's would have exactly. been in, it would have been in in makeup, creatures costume. It would have been the tank stage. It would have been. See, I think I think then, as much as that makes it more appealing to us, I think it diminishes the chances they actually did it. Yep. Because they because at le- the whole reason they took the makeup off was to get some sort of pop and some sort of extra hit. So if you're telling me it would have been that, then maybe there's a chance they're somewhere in the bill. But if it's what at the time was viewed as the band being dragged through the mud down to two original members, old news, all the band that wears the stupid makeup, I mean, then I don't think, yeah. I, I mean, we all know what the ticket counts were on that Creatures tour. I mean, I just, as great of a tour, as great of an album as it was, it just, you got to just realize it was just brutal for kiss right then so i just don't see them even being in the conversation for that if it was that version of the band yeah i i i agree i don't i don't think the us festival even had a sheet of paper of potential artists with kiss's name on it at that point in time i don't think anybody putting the us festival together had kiss in their mind well, and look at how the perception changed once Lick It Up came out and they took the makeup off. Michael's told the story many times. The local station here at KQ in Minneapolis, he called in and, and requested. And what did the DJ say to you? Uh, I got called in and I go, hey, who's that band playing that song Lick It Up? And he goes, it's Kiss. Don't they sound great? They took their makeup off. <laughs> and I'm like, Listen to the previous album. That sounds great. They had makeup on. The makeup has nothing to do with it. But from from an industry standpoint and and a a music fan standpoint it was completely different world once they took the makeup off they became acceptable because the makeup was what people were laughing at but it's still if you think about it and i love that period of the band and i could talk all day about lick it up and animalize and asylum and crazy nights and all that stuff but if you really think about it draw wise it still wasn't even close to what they were and the whole reason the reunion happened in 96 is because they weren't really pulling solid numbers they were yep. still having two really big name support acts you look at like slaughter and winger opening up just to sell an arena i mean those that's real draw those are big hot young bands at the time so they weren't they were not a pure arena no support no name support filling the building band really through the whole time there were spots of the country there were moments but it just was never really that it just never got fully back Uh, even the revenge tour the revenge tour had tons of spotty attendance so that that to me is like was it a big improvement from having stones thrown at you for even saying kiss yeah it was night and day mtv played a huge role we all know that but it wasn't, it, it, did, it wasn't even, they didn't get back to being the mega band until they, you know, did the reunion. Yeah, I mean, we had, we had a show a couple, a few years ago when we had Benny Doro on, who used to be managed by Paul Stanley in the 80s. And he shared a story about how he went with Kiss to a number of the revenge shows in the Pacific Northwest. And he said, you know, like Gene and Paul were just, bummed they'd go look at the the crowd on the revenge tour and you know it's two three thousand people you know the arena the top is all curtained off and they'd be like we played this same market just a couple years ago on hot in the shade and it was packed you know and it was like okay things have changed now obviously we all know the whole music world changed by 92 because that's when grunge was becoming the newest fashion and anything that was hard rock was out of fashion and if kiss was hard rock out of fashion because of the music they were still kiss and there's a lot of people that still discount kiss just because they're kiss let me throw one at you while we're dealing with hypotheticals reunion doesn't happen Carnival of Souls comes out in a normal way with record company support behind it as the new Kiss record, promotional run, all that. Does Carnival of Souls stand a chance in hell in any way, shape, or form on radio or anywhere if it comes out 
with full support like a regular record. Well, you know, Carnival Souls didn't do too bad with radio with the the, the couple tracks Jungle that did. they pushed. Did well. Yeah, but but I think in the end, you know, would would Kiss have been able to to launch a Carnival of Souls tour in support of it? Nothing more than theaters. theaters because I think you've got there's a double whammy. You've got Kiss fans who are giving up on them because they chased the grunge trend. And you got grunge fans who are like, that's Kiss. They're not a grunge band. I'm not going to go see them. So, you know, they're, they're, they're left with a few thousand diehards in every town. And that would have been, if the, re, if the reunion didn't happen, they would have been left as one of these bands that's continually doing the tour circuit, playing theaters for the rest of their lives. Would Gene and Paul have accepted that is the question, or would they have just retired? I think they would have put an end to it. What about if they were asked to play Monsters of Rock on Carnival of Souls? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, you know it, it, that, that, that still comes back to if it wasn't a headline spot, I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll I mean, honest, I mean though, you know, we, we, I, we know for, for Gene and Paul, it's all about biggest. We are the biggest. We are better than everything else. Whether it's real or not, perception is reality in the KISS world. And if they but they had us change a lot. I mean, look, again, I mean, when you look at 1980, okay, 79, a year earlier, I'm at Madison Square Garden two nights on the Dynasty Tour was supposed to be three, but they dropped one because it didn't sell. So the cracks are already starting to show. But still, literally up the street at the at the most famous arena in the world, two nights. A year later, they're in a theater up the street. So they, you know, they swallowed their pride to do, to do that. Uh, you know, it was couched as, well, it's a warm-up show for our new drummer. But the reality was, is that it was, you know, it was, I mean, they, it sold out, but it wasn't like a tough ticket. I mean, I know people out front that got in because that's how rough it was at that point. So, see, now you're the first person that we've had on that's actually was A, attended it and B, can say that you could get in because we, I've never heard that before. It was, well, it, it was sold out. Well, but yeah. what I'm saying is there's sellouts and then there's like really tough ticket sellouts where the tickets right. are astronomical or whatever. And I do, I had friends that went out front and bought tickets at, at, at you know, scalped, but at a reasonable yeah. amount. I do remember very vividly about that show that uh, next to the Palladium, I saw a ton of shows back at the Palladium back then. There is a alleyway between the next building and on the side, just like in an old movie theater, which the Palladium was, there would be those you know, big double steel doors where would, that would be emergency exits to the side. And uh, I remember there were people who couldn't get in standing out there uh, because they, the guard, they kept opening the door and, and you could see uh, trying to get in with their ear because you could hear the sound bleeding through those doors. Yeah. So there were people like lined up in the alleyway just trying to hear to hear what Kiss sounded like with a different drummer. It was right. really, there was, it was really, uh, I remember the band that opened got literally booed off the stage because the guy came out and played a stand-up bass. It was like a rockabilly band. They were called the Rock Cats. Right. And we're like, what? And uh, they literally, I just remember the guy dropping the stand-up bass and go, you want your fucking kiss? Go ahead. And he like, the bass, <laughs> boom, and hits the ground and he's gone. And then make sure everyone thing. knows that's not the Rockets from Detroit. Big difference. No, Rock Cats. Yes. Rock and then Rock Gene, Gene couldn't go up because there wasn't enough clearance to go up. So instead, he swung from one stack to the other, no. like a pendulum. <laughs> <laughs> it was Eddie, how what was the attendance there, if you had to guess? Uh, the capacity in the Palladium is probably about 3,000. Wow. Mm. I saw some other shows there. I saw Def Leppard open for Blackfoot, mm. which is crazy. I saw yeah. Iron Maiden headline there on just when Number of the Beast came out. I saw, you know, I saw a good amount of shows there, but I was still really young. And then, and then it closed and it turned into a disco. 
And now it was knocked down and it's actually NYU. The building that's there is part of NYU. Mm. Wow. It, is, it is It's amazing. a great building, a lot of history though. Great place to see the show. It is amazing when you look back how you illustrated it there, Eddie. From 79, they were, they were headlining two sold out shows at Madison Square Garden. And then a year later, everything is just collapsing from unmasked into the elder into creatures of the night i mean it it it's not a long period of time there that was a very fast implosion of the band yeah if you think about it two nights madison square garden and again i'm just viewing it from my perspective where i live but two nights madison square garden there were TV commercials. I remember running constantly locally to sell those shows because there was a third night that they didn't end up using, but they want, they ended up, I think, getting the two shows they did do sold out, but there was a TV spot that ran constantly. I remember as a kid, I got all excited because it was the second ever show I went to was 79. And then you go a year later and what you have in America total is the one show in New York at a theater. And then you go, so nothing for Unmasked, nothing for The Elder, and in the New York market, nothing for creatures. Which is so, so they wouldn't have played the New York market after the Eric Carr introduction show. They would not have played their hometown market again until Radio City Music Hall for Lick It Up. You know, that's, and they interesting. Did it. that's interesting you say that because, you know, I was thinking of, of Pittsburgh market too. And, you know, we had the same, we had two nights for the Dynasty Tour in 79 and they never came back and played again until 83 in the Stanley Theater, which is a tiny little, like 3000 seat theater. So that's, you know, I never really thought of it that way either until you just said that, that there was a how many years there in between where Kiss never even came back to Pittsburgh and he always knew that they would always come to Pittsburgh. I mean, it was just a, a constant on the tours that they always made stops there. And I never really thought about that. They never came back until 83 again. So 79 to 83, they never even showed up in Pittsburgh. And then when they do show up, they play in this little, itty bitty theater you know yeah, i mean and for for us it was just i mean and obviously the band i mean being living in this market i mean this was their hometown market this was the play for them this you know look every band says you know this is the greatest night of the tour but obviously a new york city band playing new york mm -hmm. city is e enormous so the fact that they stayed away for that long just speaks droves in that they just uh, well you can do a whole show on that like did they not want to play because they couldn't get booked or did they not want to appear in their hometown market after having all that success being back at that level again? Uh, I went to, they did a record signing for Lick It Up at Sam Goody's in Rockefeller Center. And I went there and I got my record signed and it was, you know, it was, there was a pretty good line and it felt good. It felt like, like, like Lick It Up definitely felt like things were like on the upswing, you know, and then little airplay they got back to playing New York. They played Radio City, obviously not the Garden, but a very prestigious venue. I think they may have even done two nights on Lick It Up. I think they did. That was my question. I've, I've been there. I put it this way. I've never been inside Radio Music Hall, but I've been in front of it a million times. What does that hold? That's like 5,000. That's pretty big. All right, so if they did two nights, it's 10,000. That's respectable. Isn't How big is it? Square Gardens? Madison Square Gardens under 15, isn't it? No, back in those days, it was closer to 20. Was it? Okay. Yeah, now, now it's closer to 15 because they remodeled it and they put a bunch of skyboxes in and ate up the seats up top, which the, the upper rung of Madison Square Garden, the, the seats used to be coated uh, with colors uh, and that would match your ticket. So like if you're in the red, the red was always the lower bowl and then you went up from there. And the top rung of seats at Madison Square Garden in the old garden the seats were blue. They were like a blue leather and they were so high up. It was known as blue heaven. So, <laughs> you know, you had seats in blue heaven and you would, you'd feel like you were in heaven too, because all the pot smoke would waft up <laughs> to the top and you'd get contact high just being up there, whether it was for Ranger games or concerts, it didn't matter. You were getting contact high and going into blue heaven. It was crazy. You know, so, you know, you know what would, would be in for a future. What if episode, what if, for for unmasked and um the elder the albums were more what you would expect from a traditional kiss album 
they weren't what they were. If they were more rocking hard rock albums, would that have helped change anything in that period of time? Or, Or had Kiss just worn their welcome out as a band and it wouldn't have mattered what they put out? Hold on a second. You got to keep that. You got to keep this because I think this is very be a very important part. Of the what if they stayed black and silver? They didn't do the Kiss styles. They didn't do if they just stood on being the loud, aggressive, hard rock band without. They they totally don't do the merchandising beyond you know what you know what cheap trick was there. But, but could... I, I yeah I mean you can play the game with your rules Mark you always do but for for me, for me the you know it, everything stays the same through dynasty it's just instead of going further away from the kiss sound with unmasked they started to bring it a little more back and the elder came back and then the creatures would a more hard rocking sound album in that period helped at all that's a that's a here's here's the here's the elephant in the room part of all this which is not being discussed or remembered when you do these hypotheticals the not to me the number one thing that put kiss into that tailspin no matter what they did unmasked elder creatures whatever the number one thing that decimated the band that at that time that they had fight years to recover from was a little song called I was made for loving you and I think when we look at this we're looking at this through a revisionist history on I was made for loving you I know now it's in the set it's viewed as this great hit song it's a big song everybody knows it's a hit I, I don't think anybody unless they lived it could understand how catastrophic of a double-edged sword that song was for them, where it just took the 90% of the, of the base up to that point and kicked them to the curb and made them violently angry. But the problem was that amount of people was replaced by young kids who loved the song and flooded the dynasty shows with their parents. And then next record comes around and there's no pop hit and there's no airplay, and then that audience is gone, and then you're left with what was left knocking around unmasked, elder, whatever. The hardcore of the hardcore that didn't abandon over the fact that they did a disco song. But you can't, if you lived through it, you can't underestimate how unbelievably damaging, uh, despite the fact that it was a hit, that song was for that band. It you was well the said. ultimate oh, two-edged sword. Spot yes, on. that's a very good point. Because yeah. imagine if if that song wasn't on that record, and Paul did uh, more of an up tempo song, whether it be like a Love Gun or something off of whatever, that could have changed the whole direction of that. Well, imagine if that song wasn't on the record, and the lead single from Dynasty was Magic Touch. Yeah. Well, you you I could you could you could just imagine, I was made for loving you is on the album but doesn't become the huge hit it is, does that help Paul realize, okay, this disco thing doesn't work for whatever reason. Now that's the kick in their butt to come back to being a hard rock band because I'm guessing with all the success I was made for loving you had led into Unmasked going, dude, we'll just do it again. Look at, we'll just repeat success. Well, I'm, gonna give, I'm, I'm gonna do a real world example Whereas if it wasn't a hit, because a lot of bands, as you know, dip their toe in the disco market, or at least the dance market. Some very successfully, the Rolling Stones and, and Rod Stewart. Stewart. Oh, but you. none that had a pedigree mark as a big, loud, bombastic, bombastic yeah. hard rock. Da- but Dan- 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 Stones, Hold Rod on. Stewart, they danced my, my around next that. Issue. They but Eddie, Eddie, Dr. Music on Mirrors helped sink Blue Oyster Cult. That 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 was their sort of and they were certainly think about it they were the they had a i think that record well i know eventually it went double platinum but the live record in 78 was platinum when they went into mirrors and they dipped their toe into you know doctor music electric drums it's not the same thing though what's that it's not, it's not the same thing hold on I'm, what i'm saying is an american rock group with a platinum live record 
in 1978, releases Mirrors in 1979, um, Doctor Music, the you know promo video. It's the the similarities are very much like Kiss, except they didn't have the success with it. Right, that, that's my point. But, but, uh, true, but most people would have no clue about that at all, and I think because Kiss it wasn't had, big. Yeah, but that's Kiss had a much I, bigger spotlight on them than Blue right. Street. Because Bloister Cult, great, they're fine for what they are, but I don't view them in the same category that I would put Kiss or Aerosmith or a lot of these other bands. No, no, play. no, not even close. Yeah, not even close. I, I agree with that, but had that song been, been a big hit, it would have made a difference. That's there are those point. songs, there are those songs in artist career where it's like it masks the problem at the time because it's a huge hit. So you're celebrating and reveling in the fact that this song's a hit and records are selling, but the audience that's there for it is not your core audience and you don't find out how fickle they are until you do that next record. Peter Frampton with I'm In You. Yes, I mean, Cheap Trick the Flame. Turbo. <laughs> yeah, those are lesser extreme examples though. I mean, I agree Turbo was, was definitely an issue, but... <laughs> um, the flame was just a cover and it was a ballad, whatever. I, I don't think that really damaged Cheap Trick. I don't think that. Um, but there's songs that are damaging and you don't know it until the next year when that fan base that was there for it is gone because they're only there for the hit. I mean, Kiss doing disco right at that time was the whole disco sucks movement. The guy blowing up the records, the backlash. And then you had this band that was known for fire and brimstone and black leather coming out in pink and purple and green and whatever and with a disco song it was like again i'm we are hardcore we're like okay we're in i was in on the elder i mean i still like the elder i like unmasked but the general public that was seeing deuce and uh you know king of the nighttime world and this band and then all of a sudden that that's just jarring and it I mean, look, I remember the knock on Kiss at the time was it was like kitty band, kitty band, because if you see the audience makeup at that time, and I think Paul wrote about it in his book, suddenly on the Dynasty tour, they look and there's like little kids there with their parents. They had never That's seen that before. Yep. That was a byproduct of that song. And, and then the bottom got pulled right out when Unmasked didn't have a hit to sustain that bass. Then nobody was left. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. God, I love this geeky talk. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I just so this is I this is just so enjoyable. So do I. I mean, what, I mean, just... what 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 ifs are so fun, especially when you can really, really come up with a odd or crazy off the wall what if scenario, and and I think there's so many of them in that period from, I'll, I'll even say from '78 with the solo albums all the way through Creatures. I mean, there's so many what ifs that can be created in that period because the band was in such turmoil. That was it. There was so much change happening internally and externally in that those years. I mean, what happens if Ace actually does the Creatures tour? What happens if he really was fully invested and play, actually played the shows? and played on the record and was all in on that. Does that change things? You know, now I talked about this on my show the other day. It, fans are so different now in that you go to a show and the guy, somebody might come out and be like, oh, our bass player isn't feeling good. So his tech is going to play tonight. Yeah, all right. You know, and uh, you know, the drummer, he, his mom is ill. So he, so we're just, you know, we're going to use his drum tech or our friend from the other band's going to play the set. And people just roll with that. Like no problem. They go to shows. They don't even know who's in the band. If there's any original members back right. then, it was a different thing. It was like bands canceled shows. If the bass player couldn't play, they didn't go find somebody in the town. Now nobody cancels. They just plug someone else in. Brian Johnson gave ACDC 40 years. You got a hearing problem? We'll see. You call Axel. It's like nuts. That didn't that happen true. back then. It was hey, huge Eddie. if somebody that wasn't in a band. You were like, oh my God, what's going on? Eddie, Eddie you, you know, obviously, you know Ace really well. Have you ever, because the reason I say this is because he did do Rock and Roll Hell on, on Origins One. Um, has he ever, have you ever talked creatures with him? Meaning, like, did, did does, well, he obviously knows Rock and Roll Hell because he covered it. 
Um, you know, he doesn't though. That was putting his head by the guy at his label. Oh, or that's what I'm asking. So I was wondering if he like was a, I'll give you a great example. As you know, Joe Perry loves lightning strikes so much. So that, <laughs> they played it afterwards. Matter of fact, I think they played it in their residency. Joe has said publicly, that's a kick-ass song. That's why I'm going to play it. I was wondering if Ace ever said anything to you like that, because you're personal friends. That, did you ever talk creatures and did you ever say, man, I wish I would have stuck around and recorded and some of that stuff's really good. Much like Joe said to the Aerosmith stuff, like, you know, I realize Rock in a Hard Place is a really strong record, at least musically. All right, so just to give you an example of sometimes like uh, how, <laughs> so I, uh, there, back in the days when I worked with Ace and signed him and did those records, I think I told this story last time I was on with you guys. Those were the days of like fax interviews because you would, people would, fat, magazines would fax in the questions and you'd have the artist answer them and fax them back pre-internet. Uh, half the interviews Ace did Ace did, I was answering the questions right. because because he, he'd be like, he'd look at the facts and go, I, I don't fucking remember. You fill it out. You remember my <laughs> shit better than me. So he, so he when, when you would bring up something like Creech, he's like, I was out the fucking door, Bobby. I don't know what the fuck they were doing. I, I had to show up for the album cover, whatever, pay, I'm out the door. I was gone. So he was like, my impression about that and, and even trying to talk to him about it is he was he was completely checked out. You know, it's it's amazing. I saw like on YouTube, I think there was video of them doing the promo for Creatures. And it was like a video interview and Ace is there and they're talking about the record and the interviewer's like, Ace, what do you think of the record? He's like, ah, I think it's good. We made some heavy rock and roll. Like if you're the interviewer and you had a sense that he had nothing to do with the record at that time, wouldn't it have been great to probe and be like, so he's tell me about your solo on uh, Danger, <laughs> you know? I, to see if he would have cracked him and like, I don't feel fucking know the song, you know? <laughs> so, so to answer your question, Mark, I mean, he's like, the whole thing with him doing Rock and Roll Hell is the guy who signed him and does his A&R now at E1 is a huge Kiss fan. Ken Gullick is his yeah, name. Yeah, great guy. Great and guy. Ken's a great guy. And Ken is uh, puts a lot of stuff you know, gives Ace a lot of great ideas. Just like, you know, back when I worked with him, I would always be like, hey, you should do this, you should do that. I, I think it's funny you bring up Joe Perry because to this day, and literally for since I've known Ace, I've been on him to cover a Joe Perry Project song Which called one? Shooting Star. Oh, I would have thought Mist is Rising. Shooting Both Star, if you listen to the lyric, my brand new ship is stellar bound, oh, yeah. all this stuff, it's so Ace, the riff is so Ace. And he's like, I want to cover an Aerosmith song. And I was like, nobody knows the song. They'll never know it's a cover. It's a deep track from an album that didn't do well. And he's right. like, I don't know. So, you know, he's open to a lot of ideas, but um, not everyone, of course, but he's open to some of them. But yeah, I don't, I don't think he had any real, like he was so I'm out of here at that point that I don't really think he even knows the record. Mm. I think I heard on your with you guys when you had Michael James Jackson on where he had said that Ace was around, at least in the studio, that he had had a recollection yes. that Ace may have actually recorded even a rhythm guitar track or something. Something, yeah. But that was so long ago. And I also, too, I wonder how different things were for Ace versus Joe Perry, you know, because Joe Perry, if you read the Aerosmith book, he talks about you know, he meets his new wife and they're driving around in the car and an Aerosmith com song comes on and he's like, oh, that's my band. And she's just like, yeah, yeah, right. You know, and I almost wonder if he missed it more quickly than Ace missed leaving Kiss. If that the, the, common, the common thread there was both of them were out of their mind on drugs and alcohol and impaired. The crazy thing about Joe was he went to see Aerosmith with Crespo on guitar in Boston. Mm -hmm. He showed up, he went, he went to the show and he went backstage and hung out with Tyler before they went on. And he gave Tyler heroin, which had him botch the show and pass out halfway through the show. And there was a conspiracy that the theory was <laughs> that he would sabotage coming with like as in, in good graces to wish his old bandmates luck 
but in reality, get the singer so high before the show that he'd have a really bad show and then be like, oh, we got to bring you back. <laughs> I was always thinking it was more like that scene um, out of Spinal Tap when uh, Nigel showed up and said, you know, we got a hit in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, the last, my last, I, you said something earlier that, and 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 we have to keep it short. But yeah. I too am a huge Crespo Dufe era. That I saw that tour twice. To me, that's like their version of Creatures of the Night, but it's so goddamn good. <laughs> um, you know, did you? How many times did you see that that uh, um, version of Aerosmith? First time I ever saw him was with that lineup. So they played a college by my house. You know, what's crazy about that. There's parallels there with Kiss. Of course, there sure there's is. A million, there's a million Kiss Aerosmith parallels, much to Paul Stanley's chagrin. Um, you guys must have seen that interview that Paul did with uh, Richard Marks, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. yeah. What's the line? Let's talk about Rod Stewart. Yeah. Yep. 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 Guys, it's unbelievable. But um, if you think about it, it's like, the, the the parallels of those two things but i i saw aerosmith with the aerosmith played the metal ends here in new jersey with that lineup and i guess again word news didn't travel like it travels now that joe perry brad whitford weren't there and that and at the end of that tour they played new jersey again at a club it was a big club, like 1500, but they played a club called the Fountain Casino. So on Rock and a Hard Place, Aerosmith actually played the Meadowlands Arena and, and bookended with a club in the same state. It's, it's crazy to think about. But I, I um, you know, I, I saw them at, uh, in, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Stabler Arena, where I also saw Kiss. Kiss started the Revenge Tour there. It's only about an hour and a half from my house. So I used to drive out there for shows. And uh, that was the first time I ever saw Aerosmith. And I love the Rock and Hard Place album. Bitches Brew is an amazing oh. song. And it's the, a really heavy record. But I also like Night in the Ruts. And Joe is on some of that. And I remember one time I said to Joe, um, I couldn't help myself. And I go, hey, uh, what do you think of the, I got to ask you, what do you think of the Rock and Hard Place record? And he goes, I hate it. And I go, you hate it because you're not on it, I assume. And he goes, no, I hate it because I'm not on it and it's a good record. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's a pretty okay. damn great answer from yeah. I think one of the coolest guys out there. So I was really, it was really interesting to hear him say that. But, uh, and then I saw Crespo like five years ago who lives in Vegas. It was the 40th anniversary of that record or 30th or whatever it was. And he played it in a, a club in Vegas, Ooh. start to finish. Oh, I and you know who was in the band at the time, Mark, who everyone knows now, but nobody really knew then, was Todd Kearns. Hmm. Oh, really? He played, uh, uh, played bass for that, eh? Because Todd, Todd used to, before he was in Slash or anything, Todd was living in Vegas and played in a band, a local band called Sin City Sinners. Yeah. And they, yeah, were, Crespo's, they were Crespo's backing band for him doing Rock in a Hard Place. Oh, wow. That would have been great to see. Because I love that record, too. I just was disappointed by the show I saw. They were a mess. I mean, yeah. I yeah. mean, they, they, you know, Tyler was, at, that was at the worst for him as far as him holding it together. Although the shows I saw, I was just happy to see him. And I didn't, Right. I, I, I was, I, I've always been oblivious to drugs. I didn't even know what was going on. I, I had a similar thing here in Detroit, because I think I saw that tour at Joe Lewis Arena, which Kiss never played, by the way. And Kiss never played Joe's. That's that was a twenty thousand seater. And I also saw them at Pine Knob, which was like twelve to fifteen thousand. So I mean, that tour did well here, you know. And you got to remember, Aerosmith was a different animal too, because they still, you know, go back to eighty three. They were still very popular on the radio, very popular on the radio. You know, it wasn't the current music, but you heard Dream on, you know, Walk This Way and Sweet Emotion, and you know. Um, all that stuff so they you know whereas kiss didn't have that sort of thing so anyways you know what eddie if we i'm just going to keep going and i know we got to get going so thank you so much yeah, and i got one all right one, one quick thing for tommy because i because i listen to you guys every week and it's one of the few podcasts i really listen to and enjoy because I'm, I'm so geeky in tune with all this shit and i love it so 
speaking of Aerosmith Kiss parallels, on a past episode, I heard Tommy go crazy about Aerosmith, I don't want to miss a thing, and all that. Yes. But do you discount the fact that nothing can keep me from you was exactly Paul Stanley chasing that exact thing right down to hiring the same songwriter. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And I don't like that song either. Okay. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, it was just, it. you know, it's like you, you try to stay young. We talk about being 12 all the time. I love this geeky talk. I love the band. I still love looking at the magazines and collecting stuff. And then I go to a concert and I feel so freaking old when they go into, uh, what was it, um, Seasons of Wither. And I'm like, oh, my God, I don't think I've ever heard him play this live. And everyone around me sits down. Like, I know. What's going on? And they, then they after did that, that in like, Detroit yes. when they played Kings and Queens. I'm up there just going, I can't yes. fucking believe it. I'm like, you yes. got to be kidding me. And then they go into it's that been, song, it, and everyone goes crazy. And I'm just like, huh. It's the age old issue that I hear from my audience all the time. We're super fans. We want to hear Kings and Queens. We want to hear Seasons of Wither. It's the ultimate tune out for the rest of the audience. It blows my mind. I went to Brazil with and hosted a festival that Aerosmith headlined. And I was there with the guys and they were making the set list and they know how I am. I, I literally got over their shoulder and go, you need some help with that? Like, because you know, I want to put in rats in the cellar and, you know, lick a oh. promise. And I'm like, oh. and, and they filled it out and they looked at, I'll never forget it. They looked at me and they're like, you're not going to be too happy. And I'm like, what do you mean? And they said there and in England and other parts of the world, they don't know, they don't really know or care about Aerosmith from, they care about permanent vacation forward. Oh. Yeah. So, and, and then, but to their credit, to this day, they'll throw in no more, no more. They'll throw yeah. in Kings and Queens for the hardcore. And we may be the only ones on the chair, but at least we get it. And True. when you think about how many hits that band has, and I know it's a whole nother conversation, they leave on any given night, they leave like five or six off the stage. They don't play them and will put in, I want to know why or something like you can't believe. So I've always given them credit as much as I, there's might be stuff in the set. I'm like, I don't need to hear, or I'd rather hear. They do always throw a bone or two to the hardcores. They do. And that's why I love cheap trick. And in fact, you have uh, lived a bucket list for me. Uh, Pick the set I, list. Yes. If I could do just one thing for one band, that would be the band. I would love to pick their set list. But Cheap Trick's an yeah. anomaly because yeah. Cheap Trick doesn't rehearse. Everybody in the band knows every song in their catalog. Jesus. When they asked me to do that and they let me do that, which came about because I was out with them and, and Aerosmith on a tour through the Midwest. But, but when they asked me to do that, they called me the night before for the set list. And I said to Carla, their tour manager, I'm like, don't make me do this because there's no way they're doing it because the songs I'm gonna pick, they don't have time to rehearse. And I'll never forget Rick said to me when he did it, he goes, what's rehearsal? We don't do that. And, and even amazingly, uh, Dax was in the band at the time. So yeah. I said to Rick, I said, how does he know the whole catalog? He goes, he knows it better than we do. So and they're does. one of those weird bands. It's not like they have this big production and the lighting cues aren't in or whatever. They're like, a, they're like the greatest garage band. They'll just knock out anything. They're the best. Oh, totally. And in fact, it's funny. Anytime they're coming anywhere near me, I'll always message Dax and say, I want to hear Up the Creek. And he just is like, yeah, <laughs> right. You know, and that's about <laughs> their, as their, kids. their version of Cold Turkey is just incredible. I love uh, I love Trick's version of that because I love that tune. You know, that's their a, new song. The new song they just came out with is really good. That, yeah, it is. It's amazing. Amazing. Oh, amazing hey, Brand, hold, hold on. Brandvold. Right now, get your calendar. Eddie, uh, we're doing the Aerosmith Kiss episode. Mike, what do we got open? <laughs> we'll book it. I'm in. Okay, let's do the Aerosmith Kiss episode. Yeah. <laughs> Aerosmith was the first band for me as a kid. My whole bedroom, you couldn't see any paint. It was all Kiss posters, ceiling, everything. So, yeah. no, so as a young kid, no other band existed but Kiss. Any other band was a threat. And the first band I let in and carved out a little space amongst among all the Kiss stuff was the poster that came in Aerosmith bootleg. 
Oh. So I carved out a little bit with Joe with the BC Rich with the flannel shirt. Yeah, oh, and yeah. I put it up on my wall. I almost love the erasers. <laughs> yeah, and I, I felt like I was betraying Kiss so bad that day, but I'm like, I guess I got to listen to at least one other band, and this is going to be the band. And it like hey, went on my closet. That's how I was with Alice Cooper. My whole room was was Kiss, and then I carved a little spot out for Alice Cooper. Same exact thing. It's like I felt kind of I was like betraying Kiss, but you know. And then the spot grows, and yeah, then and you then let I... in Black Sabbath, and then Van Halen, and then the next thing you know, you got this whole conglomerate. Yep. And then you start that was my the band going, what are you doing taking up wall space with these other bands? <laughs> <laughs> I went Kiss, and then for you guys remember the. You said those big promo oh, posters at the record store. I had I ended up getting one off a of Peaches record store. I got the double live Gonzo thing. I'll never get in 78. So it went from all kiss to like all kiss, but the big double live Gonzo. And then I got, I think, a draw the line or something, Aerosmith after that. And that's when the room started to change right around 79. But yeah, I was the same way, Eddie. It, you know, it was all kiss and then it gradually, you know, Nuge, Aerosmith sabbath i mean the first rock band i ever heard in my life was the raspberries interestingly enough an influence on paul and kiss but that was the first rock proper rock music i ever heard in my life when i heard go all the way but that was more of a singles thing and i was super young and i i got the records and i was super into it but kiss was the first thing that was like oh my god sort of thing but that was the beautiful thing about the 70s, all those 45s. You could buy all these different genres, all these different songs, because if it was a good song, it was a good song. Yeah, yeah. And I still love the Raspberries records to this day. And I still, and I'll throw this out. I want, I'm going to throw this out there to your listeners and audience, because this is the one of the holy grail things for me that I can't find. And Mark, you being a video guy and tapes and all that, I would love for somebody to find anything for me from this band, because this band is technically the first band I ever saw play live because they opened for Kiss at the first show I ever went to in 77. And that band is Piper, Billy Squire's first band. They have the live oh, yeah. album. Do you have the live album they did for the radio broadcast? No. I have that. Well, so I, I, have sent, nothing, I sent a copy to Ken Sharp. I have nothing but the two studio records. I never saw a video You'll have clip. have it tomorrow. I'll send it to you tomorrow. Mark, I never saw, is there video, is there any video? No any video, kind of but they, they did a live broadcast. Uh, really? It was, yes, it was half Ted Nugent, half Piper. When I told Ken Sharp about it, he about fell out of his chair and he's like, can you make me a oh. copy of that? And I did. Yeah, I'll send it to you tomorrow. It's great too. I would love, I'd love, thank you. And I would, I, is there anybody out, even, there's not even a promo video. If you, I know you, we got to go, but if you think about this, Piper managed by a coin. I know you guys had the author on for that. Uh, they just seem a little weird. Great yep. book, amazing book. It was yeah. great, Doug. But I said to him, you included, and I love stars, nothing against stars. Richie's a friend, but I'm like, it could have been Piper. It could have been the gods. It could have been New England. You could have subbed anyone in that spot, but I love Piper so much. And if you think about Piper, managed by a coin all the video he was doing at the time with all these bands to my knowledge there isn't even a lip sync promo video for piper two albums sean delaney produces the second one nothing i love those records there's nothing Me too. billy squire years ago i took an ad out in goldmine just to find those records on cd and billy squire himself didn't even know they were on cd and i had to tell him so it's just amazing how little on that band there is given major label a coin and and nothing. I mean, I know they weren't successful, but there's nothing out there. I think well, the radio like, show's called okay. Rock Around the World. And again, it's it's all Nugent, but the final 15 minutes is Piper. And it gets the total treatment. You know, it says, hey, this is whatever Piper, and they list, you know, Billy Squire. But I know keep in mind Billy Squire wasn't Billy Squire yet. Right. They the band and they I think they play three, four songs. I again I'll send it to you tomorrow. I appreciate it. That'd be awesome. It's really good too. Because I had it professionally, uh, I had him do the whole record. My my buddy who does all my music stuff for me, he he mastered it. it came out great. Wow, that's awesome! Thank you, Eddie. Yes. Eddie, um, for those who need reminding, where can our listeners follow you? Listen to you. Um, the best, well, the biggest thing I do now is a daily show every day, Monday through Friday, on Sirius XM. 
It's on channel 106. The channel's called Volume. It's a rock talk show. It's basically very similar to what we just did here, although it's different guests every day. And it's not just Kiss and Aerosmith. It's, you know, it's, it's the whole <laughs> world It's not rock. a perfect world. <laughs> although it's pretty heavy on Kiss and Aerosmith, if I must say. Um, but it's just, I, I call it sports talk for rock fans because that's what I model it after. And nice. different guests and different calls and topics and whatever. So it's on live every day, 2 to 4 Eastern. It replays every night, 10 to midnight Eastern. It's on the Sirius XM app. There's a sixth live show I do for Sirius, Sirius XM, Mondays only. That's 5 to 8 Eastern on 39, Hair Nation. That is music. The other five shows are mostly talk. And, um, you know, there's a terrestrial show. There's a podcast. There's some other stuff, too. And, uh, and one thing I, I'd like to mention real quick is that I, um, I did a TV show for Access TV about the last about two years ago. I did two seasons of a show called Trunk Fest. And it was me yeah. going around covering music events and going all over the country to these different settings and covering what happens at these music festivals and events. And unfortunately, they don't replay it for whatever reason. The channel was sold and not a lot of people saw it, but I put a lot of work into it and it was really fun to do. And they just now made them available on, the, on their app. So if you go to, I think it's AXS.TV and you search Trunk Fest, there's like 19 episodes and there's there's all kinds of stuff. Me on a you know at on the Monsters of Rock cruise, me at Nam, me at this event, and it's just covering the food, the bands, everything that goes on. It was more like a travel show, but it kind of flew under the radar a little bit, and now it's finally online. So um, you know people can check that out if they're if they feel like it. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. And somebody awesome. just started putting up all the old that metal shows on YouTube. I have nothing to do with it. I don't own it. I'm not supposed to know that it's there, but it's there and it's great. And we love that it's there. And it's got people revisiting the show all over again, all over the world. And I'm hearing from people all over the world who are either seeing it again or even seeing it for the first time. There's over a hundred episodes of that show. There was some amazing stuff. So uh, it's oh, kind of yeah. cool that that's the making the rounds. Flute. Yeah, you can see the smoking flute. So. <laughs> I want. I think I have that around here somewhere. Actually, that was the one thing I wanted. I'll never forget that. When he did, I had no idea he was going to do that. That oh, was fantastic. So yeah, you guys check it out and follow Eddie. That would be great. Guys, I, Eddie, I, it's Eddie, great you know with you. I sent you a nice email after we were on your show. I didn't even get a response. I didn't get. Oh, I didn't get the email. I got Mark's email. I didn't get yours. No, I guess not. I guess it was like. <laughs> no way. Never. Did you did you have the right email address? I'm not sure. I I had to look it up on your website. I'm I'm not. I wasn't privy to a special email address. Oh, that's <laughs> that goes. That's like a fan email thing that might have gotten just lost. But, well, but no, get we'll, my email, we'll send we'll get send my you his real, real one from Michael or Mark. Yeah, or we'll Tom. send you his real one, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. you're worthy I didn't of it. I think I was not appreciative, and I sent you this really nice email. And I was like, well, fuck. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Everybody no, else got I, nice emails back. Yeah, he returned the, the fat guy's one, but not the hot chick. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> well, hey, Mark, us fat guys got to stay together, you know? Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> no, Lisa, honestly, I probably got lost in that shuffle, but get get the, the personal one from the guys, and I, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> it's going to give you a little shit. It's just fine. <laughs> The show is about busting balls. Eddie, thank, <laughs> thank you so much again, Eddie. It's always it's always a blast talking with you. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. It was fun. And, uh, you know, best of luck with everything going forward, everybody, and stay safe and healthy in this craziness. Hopefully hopefully, we get back to sometime soon all actually, instead of looking at each other on screens, being together and being at shows and Amen. hanging out. So, Amen yeah. to that. Yep. Take all care. Right. Thank you. All right. Take care, Eddie. Bye. All right, Mark, start bitching. Look, I don't want anyone saying, oh, you didn't talk enough kiss this week. Ah, no kiss. What, why do I even listen to this show? If you don't have right now, if you're not fucking drained, drooling from so much kiss talk, then you're not a kiss fan. That was kiss. kiss I'm sorry. Look. Somebody's going to go. But you talked about Aerosmith. Aerosmith. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love what uh, Eddie is so awesome. He's, he's yeah. just one of us. He's a Kiss he, fan. He's, he a, is, he's a music fan. I just love hearing him talk. Like, I was like this, like, he's just, he's just so charismatic. I love, I love like, I wonder if he was a goalie. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, that just never goes away, does it? Just never. No, goes why away. would it? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. By the way, Lisa, I saw something that Brian posted about a video of you from like 15 years ago singing lead. Oh, 15 years ago? I don't know. It was a long time ago. He 30 some years ago. 30 some. Okay. We've got to get that. You've got to get that video. And we're going to do a three sides episode of us watching and reacting to it. Yes. Yes. Brian, get us that video. Don't don't worry about Lisa. Just send it to us. We're gonna make Whoa. that happen. You saw the pictures. Yeah, that's why we're gonna do a video show about this. <laughs> you know what? I'll be I'll be hundred percent honest with you. I actually didn't do too bad. I mean, I sang songs that I normally wouldn't sing. I sang like Fire Woman. I sang. Oh, I mean, I sang songs that were completely out of my wheelhouse. Completely out of my. We sang two Kiss songs. We did two Kiss songs. Uh, did you do uh, read my body uh, no because it didn't even come out yet <laughs> it was in my head though <laughs> <laughs> brian get us the video of this i've got to find and i was search i was tearing up the house looking for it and he actually burned it on a dvd and i can't find it and i and i know it's here somewhere I, it has to be here because let me tell you something big hair it was it was something. I, was I know sick. it's classic. We have to we have to review this on oh, a yeah. three sides episode. <laughs> okay. Lisa's like, no way in hell is that happening. No, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely share. I mean, you know what though? If I'm gonna get up and sing in some rinky dink bar in Pittsburgh, I don't give a shit. I'll share it. So I look like a moron, and I probably sing out of tune. And this time next, I'm actually doing a gig tomorrow night, but that's past. By the time people watch us, this will be done. You should live stream it to the Three Sides Facebook page. Do you think people would care? There's something low cut. There's something tiny low cut. They will care. Lisa, they 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 care about you and a hummingbird. (laughs) Please. Or you know what? I'll have somebody do that. Okay, that'd be great. You can you can live stream it to the page all you want. I'll do it when we do shout it out loud. Nice. I'll do that. Okay. So what's our homework then this week? Um, well, play it, play along with what we were talking about, you know, for the, the monsters, Donington monsters of rock show back around the elder era. Would it have, could it have happened? Would it have happened? What do you that think? That one makes way more sense than the, than the us festival. That's for sure. And, and, and then, yeah. Or if you feel like talking about the us festival, you know, could it have happened? Should it have happened? If it did happen, what would have happened? That's really the question I want to hear answered. If they did do it, would they have gotten booed? Would people have cared? Would rock and roll all night have, in, you know, got the crowd going? You know, it, it's really kind of interesting. You I, know? Think, I think if Kiss played Donington Monsters of Rock for the Elder Tour, they would have had bottles of piss thrown at them. Thank you. Yep. I don't because the, the the Euro press was way more friendly to them. Uh yeah, but you're going into a you're going into a and I, I went to one show at that when one year the Monsters of Rock took off, they did the Milton Keynes Festival at that same place. It is literally this bowl of well, at this point fifty thousand people, but as Eddie said back then, twenty five thousand people. They're drunk. They are the hardcore of hardcore rock and metal heads. You know, they've been camping in mud. They've literally been pissing in bottles. And if they don't like something, they throw bottles at you. I mean, I think Twisted Sister and their first appearance got yes. I thought that was uh, thrown at them. Hold on, that wasn't that was that Reading Festival. That was Reading, yeah. Same thing though. Matter of fact, Lemmy had to come out and yep, save them. Say these Mm -hmm. guys are cool. Leave them alone. But I just think coming out in the elder costumes, everything's toned down. Everything's a little softer edge. I think the fans would have been like, what the fuck? Especially after the Unmasked tour, which probably was already a bit of a shock to fans. Yeah, Yeah. but you know, if you go back and listen, because I've got that Wembley bootleg and, you know, they were it was still a hard rock show. Yeah, but the change was in the air. Let's put it that way. 
any any kiss fan every hard rock fan is like this isn't this isn't destroyer this isn't rock and roll over this isn't love gun it's not even the debut album this is different i think it would have i let's put it this way i don't think kiss would have been willing to risk what could have happened right so give us your theories we'd like to hear everybody's thoughts on it (laughs) yep you know where you know where to go leave all of your answers anywhere we are online we read them we love them you can send us emails, messages, whatever. Um, if you are watching us on YouTube, subscribe. If you're on Spotify, follow us, please. And iTunes, subscribe and leave us a review and a rating. And we got a couple guests coming up next week. I won't divulge who they are, but it's a it's two separate guests on two separate topics. We just got a lot of stuff in the pipeline here that we had to double up for next week. We got to get Eddie a gold jacket. We do. We do. The three sides logo on the pocket. There you go. I have to share a picture with you real quick. All right. Lisa, you usually do that. Right. <laughs> Hold on. Do we, ha- do we on. have to, do we have to like PayPal you money for this? And do no. we have to, does she, do we can't have to, that? This? Oh, you can't see the picture. Never mind. Never mind. You can't see it. What are you trying to do? I was going to show you this picture, but I can't now because it, it doesn't work with the virtual background, but it's fine. You don't get to see well, it. Well, that was a big dud. I'm sorry. Boy, we're turning <laughs> right into the dirt. Thank you for just, yeah, slamming the show right into the gutter. Jesus, Lisa. <laughs> this, this girl took this picture of me at this show a year ago in Boston, and it is the greatest picture I've ever seen. Um, and it just kind of exemplifies. Is it better than the pictures you send, Mark? Quiet. <laughs> That's special, damn it. Okay, I'm going to see if you guys can see this. Can you see this picture? Better yes. than it was before, yes. All right. That, is that you with the arms up? That's me right there. She is got that, a light in their is left that hand. not the greatest picture ever? Good That's job. Awesome. Yeah, you, you need to blow that up and put it on the, the in the living room. That is the greatest picture ever. I'm, she, I, I was like, that is the coolest ever. So I have to give, um, I have to give shout out to Sandra Hendrickson Haynes. I think. Oh, I know Sandra. Yeah. So we, we actually, I didn't realize that she, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Oh. I didn't realize that she. Lisa just did, yelled at the kids. I did. Did you see this? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize that she lives in Alpharetta and we've been to so many shows together and didn't even realize it. So. Now you have a new friend. I have a new friend. Bill, tell me. I'm so excited. So anyway, that was my picture I just wanted to share. Awesome. I'm done now. All right. So now that the show has been totally just thrown off the rails here, let me see if I can figure out how to end this. We did all the plugs. We were talking about our guests coming up. We got a lot of guests coming up, actually. Um, That's it. You know where to go leave your homework. We'll see everybody next week. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.